sunny morning um, to the Sunday service of the Horwich and Rivington Team Churches. I hope it, it's sunny at the time of recording. I hope it's continued till uh, Sunday morning and it will continue beyond. And I hope you've all been enjoying this glorious weather that we've been having. Let's begin the service with a prayer. Come all of you, just as you are, to worship. Whether today you feel strong or weak, full or empty, God welcomes you all into God's in-crowd. Come just as you are to worship. Loving Lord, you look us in the eye and remind us that we are already part of your family. Help us to let go of anything that gets in the way, that we may worship you with all our hearts and wholeheartedly love all our neighbours. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we are connected by love. Jesus, help us to say and do all that helps us to live as your family today. God of all, as one family, we worship you. We are mothers and fathers, we are sisters and brothers, and we worship you. We are sons and daughters, aunts and uncles, grannies and granddads, and we worship you. We are cousins and neighbours, friends and colleagues, and we worship you. As your family, as your church, as your community, we worship you. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. Are you in with the in crowd? An in crowd is a small group of people who may be fashionable, popular, powerful, but who do not let others or many others join them. A family or community of like-minded people, if you like. It may be a community of fashionable people um, maybe an in crowd where everybody is always smart all the time, whether they're doing the dishes or not. Um, they're always well dressed. They have brand names on their clothes and the right trainers. Um, an in crowd of fashionable people. It may be an in crowd, a community of very popular people who attract others to them because of their um, charismatic personalities. It might be um, a community, an in-crowd of, of, of powerful people, a powerful group who make decisions which affect other people's lives, um, sometimes for the good and sometimes not. Well, perhaps these things don't really bother you. You're not worried about whether you're in with an in-crowd or not. It just doesn't concern you. But I wonder, who do you think would be in Jesus's in-crowd? Do you think those people were fashionable or powerful or popular even? Well, the stories we read in the, um, in the Bible, in the Gospels, say no, because these are not Jesus's priorities. In today's reading, we get um, an idea of who Jesus might consider to be in his in-crowd. That's his family and his close community. And why it upset some of the people of the time um, who he chose to be in that community, who, who he defined as members of that family. And in the, uh, the reading, Mark uses a story within a story. Uh, and both stories speak of relationships and how we be behave to one another. And Jesus redefines family as those who do the will of God. That's family. Um, and therefore he's expanding the meaning of it. Uh, and he's expanding that meaning for us too, who we consider, uh, who we could, should consider to be uh, um, our, fa our family. So the reading is from Mark chapter 3, verse 20 to the end. And just to um, perhaps set a bit of the scene, how it may have been, Jesus 
is drawing crowds of followers in Galilee, um, where his family are concerned about the fear and rumours that surround him. Jesus' family in Nazareth has a problem. It runs, we think, a respectable carpentry business. Family members are pillars of the local community. Jesus, who probably worked brilliantly in the carpenter's shop, has left home. He appears to have become a travelling vagabond, drawing crowds with his teaching, healing and casting out of demons. But he is too attracting negative attention from scribes who have come down from Jerusalem. Let's hear the reading. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes him and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting round him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time to make good disagreement loving was the headline in an article in the Church Times this week written by Christopher Landau. He proposes a more distinctively Christian way to handle conflicts in the Church. The Archbishop of Canterbury has spoken often of the need for good disagreement. In his book Living Reconciliation he writes, We do not have the option if we love one another in the way Jesus instructs us, simply to ditch those with whom we disagree. You do not chuck out members of the family. You love them and seek their well-being, even when you argue. Good and loving disagreement is a potential gift to a world of bitter and divisive conflict. It is this reference to loving disagreement which might prompt something more fruitful among disagreeing Christians. While good disagreement risks being an end in itself, managing a problem rather than solving it, an appeal to loving disagreement surely evokes Jesus' own summary of the law, where loving your neighbour is foundational. In our passage today, Jesus draws crowds of followers in Galilee, where his family are concerned about the fear and the rumours that surround him. Mark uses stories which speak of relationships and how we behave towards each other. Jesus redefines family as those who do the will of God and therefore redraws the boundaries for community. The passage calls us to be brave in facing the conflicts that can arise in response to one who brings God's blessing to others. Jesus says, 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. How though, how when tempers are raw and anger is at the forefront, can we embrace this unity? Well, Jesus is firstly gracious, even though the religious leaders spoke cutting words which were sent to wound and divide. Aligning Jesus with Satan was as far from the truth as you could get. But this was their cry. Don't trust him, they are essentially saying. But despite this, Jesus calls them to him. This is almost counter to what our instincts usually say. If someone has hurt or provoked us, our worldly response is often to shut down, to remove ourselves, to push the person or persons who have hurt us away, to call them names and to imagine all sorts of vengeful thoughts or situations where they're distant and punished. Here Jesus was dealing with leaders who were not only hurting him, but speaking against his father, speaking against God. And still his response is to call them to him. Jesus remains in this constant position of open, loving arms. It is no accident that as Jesus is nailed to a cross and pierced through his hands and his feet, that when he is tortured by humankind, his arms are open and wide. The openness speaks to us of inclusion, of exposure, of freedom, of being vulnerable, and the wideness speaks of expansive and spacious love. And after he calls his enemies to him, Jesus spoke to them in parables, in stories. Stories have a powerful impact upon us. They draw us in. Most of us have a favourite story. This can be a book, a film or a play, for example. We can remember details from stories that surpass most of the facts that we can usually keep in our minds. Stories can bring people together and often offer a platform for discussion and deeper thinking. In May this year, the BBC launched its Good to Talk series, a week of themes around mental health by remembering it's good to talk, sharing stories and the ability to heal. But the stories that Jesus told are even more powerful in that Jesus uses a simple story, a parable, to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. The parables speak to us of the mystery of God. But part of the beauty is that stories can be understood in a personal way, but their broadness can also make them easier to digest, an indirect way to teach a concept and a broadness that speaks to the we as well as the I. In Mark, Jesus speaks of kingdoms and houses divided and a strong man's house plundered. There is subtlety here, yet he speaks to the heart of humankind for unity. Jesus also responds to these leaders with logic. He points out that their accusation makes no sense. It's absurd that evil should cast out evil. The leader's prejudice blinds their judgment. In closing their hearts and minds to the voice of God, they're risking their ability to listen to God in the future. After all, if the Holy Spirit is an unclean spirit, who is left to call us to repentance? If Jesus could expel demons, then it must be because he was in possession of a power that is greater and stronger than Satan. This in turn means that Satan's reign of sin and death is over and that God's reign has already begun in the hearts and minds of humankind. Clear-headedness can bring calm to the storm. How often do our feelings of outrage and bitterness lead us to thinking and acting in illogical ways? Finally, there's warning and challenge. In the early part of chapter 3, Jesus healed many people, but he also called out those religious leaders. He called them out on their legalism, that they cared more about Sabbath regulations than they did about the health and the heart of a worshipper. 
the undermining, destabling effects of evil spirits on individuals and communities comes in many guises. The mocking voices suggesting that Jesus was crazy. The accusing voices of the scribes from Jerusalem. The ashamed voices of Jesus' family. Social media is known to compound negative mental health issues on impressionable young people. What are the voices that undermine our own communities and how do we confront them like Jesus? In Mark we come to know the Jesus who calls us to him with open arms, the Jesus who unites by story, the Jesus who makes sense with logic and the Jesus who challenges. It's hard to be fully aware of what's influencing us and we need diverse and honest voices to help us see clearly who we are. Voices that love and embrace, voices that unite, voices that speak sense, and voices that challenge as Jesus did. Creating a new community to serve God was and is Jesus' mission. His example is key. The wider world might well think that to love anyone with whom one disagrees is ridiculous and that loving disagreement is a contradiction in terms. But the challenge for the church is to recognise that this kind of charity really does begin at home. We're not merely called to love an anonymous food bank user or to love and be compassionate when we hear of a local tragedy on the news. But we're called to love that member of our own parish congregation with whom we disagree profoundly. The person whom we shy away from. The member who may seem to wind us up even before they speak. And yet in the midst we can hear Jesus' cry. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever deserves openness, unity, reason and challenge. This whoever is me, this whoever is us, and this whoever is them. Jesus calls on family. Can we do the same? Shall we pray? As we begin to pray, Lord, weave a silence onto our lips. Weave a silence into our minds. Weave a silence within our hearts. Help us to close our ears to distractions, to close our eyes to attractions and our hearts to temptations. Calm us, Lord, as you still the storm. Still us, Lord, keep us from harm. Let all the tumult within us cease. Enfold us, Lord, in your everlasting peace. Amen. We give thanks today for all those who have remained faithful to you, true brothers and sisters of Christ, down through the ages until this present day. Those in whom we recognise your goodness, whose love for you and your teachings continue to inspire us and lead us by example. We give thanks for being able to worship you joyfully, openly and freely. And in doing so, bring to all hearts and minds all those for whom worship must be conducted in secret, behind closed doors or face opposition, rejection, persecution or worse. And Lord, we beg that you give your strength to all those who are spiritually weary those who are losing hope or are in despair. Lord, we call out to you. Hear us and answer us. We bring before you all those the world over who are living in war-torn societies, families shattered by loss and overwhelming grief and exhaustion, with seemingly little hope of a peaceful existence. We think in particular of Israel and Palestine, Lebanon, Syria and Afghanistan among many. And we pray for those who seek to end the fighting and promote a lasting peace. 
for those trying to rebuild damaged communities, for the doctors, nurses and other healthcare workers in hospitals that have had got inadequate supplies to care for the wounded. We pray for those who must bury the dead and those who comfort the bereaved. For all these, Lord, we call out to you. Hear us and answer us. We continue to give thanks for our own scientists tracking the different outbreaks of coronavirus for developing vaccines which accommodate new variants. Locally, we think of close neighbours in Bolton, Bury, and Blackburn and hope that their numbers of active cases will soon reduce. We give thanks for all those who, day after day, go out and administer the vaccines and for all those stationed in hospitals caring for the most affected and seriously ill. We give thanks for all those who work in education, social services, funeral directors and other public offices. For all the cleaners, shop workers, postal staff and delivery drivers, all having to adapt to different modes of working during this time of pandemic. Protect them all, this we pray. Lord, we call out to you. Hear us and answer us. We ask that you guide all those who work in our governments, both local and national, that they may respond with integrity, honesty and understanding as people face up to the new economic challenges that now lie ahead. Be with our world leaders later this week as they meet in Cornwall for the G7 summit to discuss the way forward out of the pandemic as well as global concerns over climate change. We pray these world leaders will agree much more about tackling carbon emissions, deforestation and all that leads to global warming. And at the same time we bring before you the people of Sri Lanka following a recent disaster as a chemical carrying ship sinks in its oceans spilling out toxic substances that will damage much of the marine life and scar their beaches. Lord, we call out to you. Hear us and answer us. We thank you for our team of churches here in Horwich and Rivington, for our team clergy, and with them, we pray that you will soon direct the right person to come to us as our new rector. We give thanks for all those who this week attended the Archdeacon's visitation to be admitted as church wardens to our four churches in the team. God grant them all wisdom and your loving guidance always as we face the challenges before us. We give thanks for the work of all our PCCs and others involved in the ongoing organising church business. For those who visit the sick and the lonely, those who coordinate our food bank collections, those who compose our newsletters and magazine in order to keep us informed and up to date with all that is happening, for those who sit quietly at home and pray for us all. We ask for your blessing on all who do your work with willing hearts and hands. Lord, we call to you. Hear us and answer us. And now, Lord, in the quiet of our hearts, we bring before you all those whom we are concerned about right now. Family and friends who are sick, lonely or bereaved. Those we know who are worried about the future, about employment and possible debt those who simply feel they can no longer cope with life. We pray that you will help us to help them, that through our deeds and words, they may still see your light shining out in the darkness. 
Shine down on us all, Lord, with the healing gifts of your grace. Shine down into the darkest parts of our souls. Shine down onto the coldest parts of our hearts. Brighten our nights of darkness with the dawn of your radiant love. May your spirit move over us all to dazzle us that we may then reflect the splendour of your unfailing love. Amen. And as we close, we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Today, I'm going to use the traditional format, but obviously I invite you to use any version of your choice. So we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I'll finish with a Scottish blessing. If there is righteousness in the heart, if there is righteousness in the heart, there will be beauty in the character. If there is beauty in the character, there will be harmony in the home. If there is harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. If there is order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. So let it be. Amen.